What's good everybody, it's your boy Von back again with another video, and no, it isn't another power video. I'm sorry for everybody that who wants to see another power video, but we're gonna do a little something different. And I really wanna take this time to really get back to what I originally did at first, which was covering uh, video games. But um, I'm gonna do a character bio for the series that everybody loves from the 2000s, which is the Def Jam series. Def Jam Vendetta, Def Jam Fight for New York, Takeover and obviously uh, Death Jam Icon, the one that nobody likes to talk about. But I'm gonna do character bios for them, and if, and if this video gets a lot of likes, then I'm gonna probably keep continuing it. And but until then, you know, make sure you run those likes, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff, and let's see what happens. Now today, I'm gonna be talking about the man himself, the one that the man that people feared, the man that people hated. The, basically the guy that you love to hate people hated him in Def Jam Vendetta, in Vendetta and then people loved him in Def Jam Fight for New York so we're gonna really you know start off with the man himself in the words of Craig a fake ass Shug Knight you fake ass Shug Knight the man himself D-Mob now D-Mob wasn't always D-Mob he started off as Daryl Lewis and he grew up on the rough streets of Baltimore, Maryland while still in his teens, he turned a neighborhood corner into a network of hustlers who worked for him. By the time he came to New York City, he was a bona fide crime lord. In his bid to control the city's underworld, he began buying up clubs all over town, running illegal fights and gambling operations outside of the clubs. Over time, D-Mob grew a large and loyal crew of followers held together by mutual respect and a code of street ethics. Now, let me stop real quick. D-Mob, the thing that's always been intriguing to me about D-Mob is that he always operated based off of respect and loyalty, but specifically respect. You can't really talk to D-Mob without him mentioning respect at least maybe once or twice. He's always talked about it because it's always a part of him. And I wonder if, you know, his parents or somebody he grew up with, you know, gave him that insight about what respect really is. And that's how D-Mob always carried it, whether if it was dealing business in the streets or approaching business with other rival crews, you know? And D-Mob, obviously as he got to New York, he wouldn't meet none other than the Def Jam's other, fi other fighting main uh, antagonist, which was played by Snoop Dogg, Crow. Now, Crow started off as a gangbanger on the West Coast, and when he hooked up with D-Mob's crew, when he went to New York City, then the two became partners. But along the way, they started having a little bit of problems with each other. But I'm not gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in another video. But now we're gonna focus on the prequel to Def Jam Vendetta. Def Jam Vendetta. In the prequel, Def Jam Fight for New York, The Takeover, D-Mob once again plays as the main antagonist, alongside with his business partner, Crow. At the time, he was the owner of the Dragon House, the infamous Dragon House that everybody knows of. The protagonist first meets him after winning the Dragon House tournament and gives him advice on the future. Throughout the rest of the game, he has secret meetings with Officer Starks. Yeah, now everybody, if you remember Def Jam 5 from New York, you remember that nigga Officer Starks, discussing what to do with the main protagonist. After Crow murders the protagonist's mentor, which was named OG, the protagonist vents his anger towards D-Mob, and who tells him to wait before taking on Crow. He then offers to become his partner and helps the protagonist take over areas of New York City, building up his own crew. Eventually, the mob's treachery comes to light after the protagonist's crew were celebrating their takeover of New York City at the Babylon. Turns out, the mob boss, which was D-Mob, he, he was actually profiting off of the fights that the protagonist had and used Angel to distract the protagonist from his real true intentions, which was to take on Crow. And then he told Crow, as a way of manipulation, to kill OG and help the cops raid the Babylon. You see somewhat the power comparison with this right here? Manipulation. And not long after this, he is finally confronted at the 125th Street Station, where he was later defeated. The player has the option to either throw D-Mob into the oncoming subway train, or he turns the cannon route, survives, and builds his own empire leading up to the events of Def Jam Vendetta. Now, we already know from this video that D-Mob actually started off using respect as a way of not only getting by, but as a way of opening doors for himself. But then as he soon opened those doors for himself, he started using fear as a way of 
not only scaring the people he worked with, but as a way of manipulating and throwing people under the bus to still remain on top for himself. So you can obviously say that D-Mob in the prequel of Def Jam Vendetta and also in Def Jam Vendetta, he was obviously a selfish person and not so level-headed as, as he was in Def Jam Fight for New York. And to top it off, you know, he, he was so dirty, he was literally clapping Angel's cheeks. He was literally clapping her cheeks away from, them, away from the main protagonist. You know what I mean? Like, D-Mob was a dirty dude, you know? But if y'all enjoyed that video and y'all want to see a part two of me explaining um, uh, D-Mob's role in Def Jam Vendetta, everybody's favorite video game, let me, you know, comment below, comment, and also comment other, like, theories or, you know, anything else y'all guys want me to do or which I expect from D-Mob or which I think D-Mob was hiding or whatever. And make sure y'all like, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. And your boy Von out. Peace. You punks are all the same. No skill.